great work that you and the organizing committee uh, put together and for inviting me to, uh, to deliver this tutorial <coughs> on online learning, basically, with a tool that is uh, popular, has been popular over the last 10, 20 years, the Gaussian processes. Uh, but our contribution is to come up with an augmented version to, that is ensemble Gaussian processes. And uh, I will try to uh, show some pop uh, nice applications in signal processing and uh, networking, IoT, and mobile edge computing. So the, this work is due to a number of people that now are doctors or professors, most of them, except for this last guy, Konstantinos Polizos, who is still a PhD student, younger. So, feel free to interrupt me anytime you want, uh, and we'll take it. I have more topics and slides than uh, what I can cover, uh, but uh, I will play it adaptive with your questions. Okay? So, here is the motivating context. We have interconnected uh, devices. Um, that are networked, and this is what people refer to as IoT. What is desired in the design of IoT is real-time processing, scalability, because those networks can be the millions, robustness and adaptivity of unknown dynamics, as well as safety and uncertainty quantification. This uncertainty quantification uh, in, the in the rest of the park will play a major role. And the high level goal is we want to do online learning. That's the target for real time with scalability and robustness and adaptivity and YouTube. And I want to demonstrate how this can be helpful for IoT applications and other data driven learning applications, as well as IoT management through what people like to call either black box or bounded optimization and reinforcement learning. Okay. So this is the agenda. So basically, the emphasis of the talk will be on tools and algorithms and notions. But I will demonstrate uh, some of these ideas through uh, real data sets. So I will divide it into two parts, the three parts, I'm sorry. The first one will be about the ocean processes and random features, and the applications will include the monitoring of IoT. Part two will be uh, on the ensemble uh, side and the uh, online, or what people like to call sometimes incremental. Uh, machine learning, uh, people like this, uh, and it is different from the way that we, uh, in signal processing, call online algorithms, what we call about that, in the sense that sometimes the input-output do not come together. So you do something with a certain input, and then nature responds, uh, perhaps adversarially, with another output. So things are not stationary in general whenever you uh, play with incremental. In the third part, I will try to demonstrate how this notion of Gaussian processes from machine learning can help uh, basic challenging problems in optimization as well, and reinforcement learning. So let's start with part one. Uh, I will introduce Gaussian processes and deep Gaussian processes and li links with deep neural networks. But let me start it slow and argue that uh, in a bunch of applications here given a set of data xt, uh, which sometimes we call input, or uh, feature vectors, and output y of t. Here I took it to be scalar, not bold. And capital T is the number of data. This is what uh, we call training data. And my goal is to find a mapping from xt to f of xt. I want to find the mapping f. But sometimes I don't get 
the row Ft, I get noisy versions of it, which we call Yt. Yt would be Ft plus Nt, for example. Could be even worse, not additive. Could be multiplicative or whatever. So I am after the mapping F. Example one, linear regression. It doesn't get uh, more standard than that. We have over here the x and the y axis uh, that are input output. Uh, the dots are, uh, you want to connect the dots and, uh, and draw a curve, a function uh, that minimizes the sum of the squares. And uh, this curve fitting, we know it from high school perhaps, is extremely useful for a number of tasks. For example, temperature, uh, forecasting, and it is a linear function. But not all functions are linear. In fact, the, the weather uh, prediction or the temperature prediction typically involves nonlinear functions. But the problem is like that. The other prototype uh, group of problems refers to classification problems where it could be a linear classifier followed by memoryless linearity, like the sine function, if you have a, a malignant or, or, or uh, benign uh, class. And here, I saw it also with a line separating the x and the y's uh, into uh, blue crosses and red minuses. But uh, in several challenging applications, such as you know, classification of brain uh, images, uh, the, the classification boundary is no longer a line. It's a generic function. Okay, and I'm after this generic function. Here I started my description with input-output data, but there are other, there are several tasks that uh, boil down again to function learning, but they, they have available only either x data only or y data only. Okay. And typical applications are dimensional reduction, how from a y that has a large dimension, you can go to a latent or a known x which has a lower dimension, or clustering, you group data into a prescribed number of clusters. You identify anomalies and so on. So all I'm trying to say is that learning functions can solve a variety of applications. Now, so let's start recognizing that when you have finite points on a two-dimensional plane and you want to pass a curve through them, right? The number of curves you can pass is infinite, right? What happens in between? And you have zero error given the training. So the problem, in a way, it is ill-posed. It doesn't give a unique solution. So what do you do? In Sina processing, people know the tricks. They say, ha, oh, imposed unlimitedness. Okay? And then you can pass a curve through this. And through the reconstruction, reconstruction formula, you know it's unique. And the functions that are the building blocks from the points to the continuous curve are the sync functions, shifted sync functions, right? Now, uh, the truth is that oh, other alternatives, I forgot to say, are prior information, regularizer, Stihonov, and so on and so forth, that can make the problem be well posed. But there is a systematic approach to getting to the, that uh, desirable set of uh, constraints, and this is to postulate that the space of functions f that you are after are expressed as a linear combination of uh, a building blocks or elementary functions that sit on each and every xt point. 
pretty much like the sig function. Okay, so, and this function is called kernel. And we'll deal with these kernels a lot in this talk. And just to tell you that it's not only by limitedness, but it is even RBF, soulless space constraints. You don't need to understand that, but I just tell you that other properties, you know, bounded, let's say, to derivatives, uh, welcome kernels that are not uh, six, but they are Gaussian bells. See, the Gaussian, this Gaussian bell sits exactly at xt. You should have imposed Gaussian bells. Okay. You can prove this you know, forms a Hilbert space. And then you can start asking the problem. Okay, I'm given a finite number of data capital D, <coughs> and I select a cost between the Y and the F, and I have a monotonic function omega of what is the norm in the Hilbert space of this function F, and use that as a regularizer. And this guarantees that you can have a well posed problem. And as an example, let's take least squares. This one is the norm of f minus y. And the L2 regularizer, the norm of f squared. And this boils down to what we know as the rigid relation, the form of realization. Okay. Now, I have four questions that would motivate me to talk about an alternative to this beautiful approach that we are. And that, these are the questions. Which kernel is good for me to select? Question number one, critical, right? Uh, what if I have prior information about this function? How that do I incorporate it? And then, after I decided these two design parameters, uh, design questions for Alfred Higgs, the next question is how can I solve this problem efficiently? Okay. We'll come to the problem, to the issue that this problem, the solution, an efficient solution is easier said than done. And then, after I've done that, how do I know how well have I done? So, performance analysis. Okay. So all these four questions motivate moving from a deterministic viewpoint of f to a probabilistic or random way, which is what we learn from uh, Bayes' theory. Yes, sir. Yeah, I want to ask like the when you will see when we do have a deterministic function now in the sum. Uh, the sum goes to infinity, no? So, but why does it? Does it ah. Yes, I should have said that. Ah, the question was, uh, although I promised up here to go to infinity, down here, all I have is up to t. So the question is why? <coughs> okay, there is a very good theorem which says basically that if you only have capital T training data, the best thing that you can do is to stop at t. So the rest of it adds to the, to the cost function. Okay? So you can prove it. Yes. I was just wondering if there's any theoretical foundation for this expression, maybe like the Which expression? Yeah, it is approximation theory, but this is, um, what's the name of this theory that guarantees the, eh? Representative theory, sorry. Representative theory. Yes, sir? Eh? No, no, representative theory. Okay. So, are we okay on the same page, most of us, right? Okay. So now, I want to switch gears and go to the Bayesian world, where I would advocate uh, letting this function f as random. And uh, I, I basically adopt a Gaussian process prior. Let's define that business. What is a Gaussian process? 
prior. Okay, some symbols. Uh, this is without personal generality a zero mean assumption. It looks like, you know, strange because it's like a function value, but I use this tilde to say that it's drawn from a Gaussian process with zero mean and kernel kappa xx x, x prime. Okay. The definition is the following. If you take T uh, from one up to little t, okay, and you stack the function values in a vector, then you get this Ft, which is well defined. And now vectors, I know what's the motivated version of the right? So it's a function values. And it has a corresponding kernel matrix K sub T, which clearly is T by T, right? And each entry of this, the ij, is the covariance of the function values at points xi and xj. How the maps f xi, f xj are correlated, that's what it is. But in this definition, for the story to be complete, the most important part is the last little for all t. This should happen for all t. Okay? That completes the definition of a function obeying. HEP, B, HEP. All right. So we have a prior. You can start saying, what is GNI? What are you talking about? You know, the function values of Gaussian all the time, all the functions, what are you talking about? There's no way, right? To believe that every function that I look looks like a Gaussian process. Be patient. This is a prior. Okay? And it is done for reasons it will become that will become transparent soon. What I'm trying to say is in the Bayesian world, you don't care necessarily about the function values, but you care about the posterior density. Meaning, what is the probability of F given the data? That's what matters. That you don't want it to be Gaussian, and in fact, it's not Gaussian, always. There are special cases it is, but it's not always. But yes, sir? Does this try the maximum entropy? Take this? Yes. 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 yes, absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. But <coughs> this does not necessarily mean that it will get you faster to the posterior of your life. That's the end. Actually, we advocate the ensemble for exactly that reason. But we don't like to be confined and start on always from a prior. <coughs> That's a Gaussian belt. But we'll get there. <coughs> Kevin, you're ignorant. You want to inject this less information. Yeah, exactly. So, but we're giving x, these yellowish squares. I will stack them for convenience into a columns of a matrix x of t. And let's think of it for now as deterministic. The input is deterministic, the rest of it. So if I want to target the posterior, the next thing I have to do is look at the data likelihood, the condition likelihood. Okay? So why given F? These are where the data come into picture now. And then the likelihood for convenience if it is factorizable, mean, meaning independence is assumed here, <coughs> or correlatedness is Gaussian, right? But what is critical is that the, this is straightforward. If you remember what I told you, the f of xt is mapped, or is received as a yt, which is f of xt plus noise t. Now, if the condition is additive noise and it's Gaussian IID, that's it. This is satisfying, right? So you, you appreciate that. It's like saying my noise is Gaussian. Not many people will blame you if you say my active noise is Gaussian and IID would be wide. Okay. So we have a prior. We have a likelihood. We are ready to fulfill the uh, ultimate goal of GP-based learning. 
uh, you can learn the posterior of f using Bayes' rule, p of f of t given by t. Notice here I have semicolon by t because I treat it as deterministic. And this is nothing but uh, the, 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 the prior and the conditional likelihood, and the denominator is y's data, right? That's not the Okay. And this gentleman up here is Mr. Gauss, who is responsible for all this stuff. Okay. Let's now uh, proceed with inference or testing how this learning proceeds. Suppose that I'm given a training data x, y, t, now all of them collected, right? And a test the input x star. It would be x t plus one, but let's say generically x star it could be x t plus three, whatever, right? And I want to infer y star, or to be more Bayesian, uh, you know, obedient to the Bayesian theory, I want the PDF of y star. Very good. We'll proceed in two steps. We start from x star that is given, and my first step is to create the f star, which is the value corresponding to this x star. And it doesn't take, you know, too much to recognize where the correlation of the function values, f1, f2, f3, blah, 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 is helping you. And the matrix kernel, the kernel matrix, which is nothing but the covariance of f, is helping you. Why? Because look straight on this line. You know f1, f2, ft. Ah, you can infer f star, right? There's a correlation. Well, you know, related extrapolation. If you want to follow the mathematics, okay, what you do is the posterior PDF of the function value, you write it as uh, the f star uh, comma f, and then you integrate the f, right? That will give you the star given y, correct? And then this joint, you will write it by Ken Bayes. f star given ft, when I told you. These guys are helping you to do the job. And then P of ft given yt. Let's be careful. This guy is nothing else but the computable posterior. I have already, because I'm outside. I, I, I've known this. And what's the other guy? What I told you. The transition prior, if you like. Why? Because whenever something is Gaussian, then it's not too difficult to, uh, it's like this is, as we will see, the LMMSC of F star. You can extrapolate with Gaussian, you can have the conditional mean, and this is the coherence. Okay? Kappa star star is the kernel of X star, X star. Okay? Mm -hmm. Alright, so that's the first step. So we started from here, we managed to get this guy. Okay? Then we are after the Y star. So what do we do? We, we invoke the likelihood, y star given f, this is the data, and then we multiply with uh, the previous function value, pdf, and then you integrate over pdf star, and then you get the probability, the pdf of y star. Remember that was my ultimate objective. I wanted to find y star, or the probability of y star. Okay, that was my ultimate objective. And, okay. and if you ask me, how do I do that? There are two options here. Either you do uh, Monte Carlo sampling, if this likelihood is from the ocean, okay? But if this likelihood is Gaussian, my life is much easier, okay? Yes, someone wants to ask a question, go ahead. Quick question, you also talked to come out the star, does it mean that you allow for different functions or turtles at every time step? No. For the time being, I have only one. Kappa star is a shorthand, shorthand, uh, the, the question was, what is kappa star? Kappa star is kappa, you need two pairs, x star or my x star. So that's why it has two stars, right? It should be correct, star star. It's not kappa star or red star. It is kappa star star. 
Yeah, it's just the, the value that takes that extra. Yeah. Okay, good, good question. Okay. Now, I was at the point where I said, this is okay. I wrote down everything, convinced you that it's a viable theory, but you know, these things are integrate. Uh, I have to integrate this business, my effect that grows every time I collect another T, or, right? So this would be easier said than done, the first one. And likewise for the second one, at least the second one is scale, if I'm after the scale of thing. Okay? Someone wants to ask something else? We're well, good. Okay. So let's talk about regression. And then, if the likelihood that you saw earlier is Gaussian, then we know that uh, there is a uh, reproducing density, right? So if I have the prior Gaussian, likelihood Gaussian, then the posterior is Gaussian. And uh, voila, uh, a Gaussian is characterized by the mean invariance. This is the point estimate of your Y star, which is the position expectation. And this is its uh, variance, its uncertainty quantification. Once for a Gaussian PDF, I give you the mean and the variance, you need a full characterization of the randomness, right? And uh, if you think about it, if you notice what I'm doing here, this is like the autocovariance of the Y data. This is a linear estimator in terms of Y. And this is the cross covariance between the X star and X and on all others. So, you want to call it uh, anything. You can, you can call it with a filter. You can call it the LMMSC. It's up to you. But basically, we know that if we play with uh, map estimators, that's what I did, you know, of conditional expectations, for Gaussian processes, they are linear. OK? And this is Mr. Wiener. I had to include him at some point. OK. Now. Uh, not every day is a rosy day, so not. Uh, you have Gaussian and Gaussian, then you get Gaussian, but okay. And, and by definition, when you migrate <coughs> away from regression, linear regression, and you go to classification, for example, there's no way in the world you're going to be playing with the Gaussian likelihood. Why? Because in logistic regression, for example, y given f, the y is plus minus 1, it's binary. A binary thing cannot be Gaussian, right? Binary. So basically, uh, you cannot do it. However, people, and I cite all the references at the bottom, uh, have come up with Gaussian approximations of non Gaussian posteriors. Okay? So basically, they find the mean of an approximating Gaussian by maximizing the, it's a BAP version, but maximizing the condition of Y given F and LN F. And this one has this particular uh, covariance. So the posterior is approximately Gaussian. And then, if your likelihood, uh, yeah, the function value already we have seen, because the prior is Gaussian, if this can't be Gaussian once again, then the left hand side is Gaussian. And we come down to the last step. That again, this one is not as, as difficult to, uh, to believe that you can do with Monte Carlo something, you can approximate. It's a scalar guy, right? So you start drawing samples, and then you, if you want to uh, integrate, then you sum one over another samples at the points that you have. So are we familiar with the yeah, important sampling or the Monte Carlo sampling? OK, so I don't need to elaborate. It can be numerically easily handled. OK, okay. So, so far I told you, what is Gaussian process? And I told you uh, how it manifests itself in a, a linear prediction problem or prediction problem in general, uh, or regression problem 
even if it's not linear regression, and uh, classification as well, right? Now, I want to tell you something that you will be surprised that the deterministic viewpoint does not help. Okay? I make an argument, because all of these things I forgot to say, incidentally, I should have pointed out that the LMNSC expression in the Gaussian case is identical to the rich regression. It's another formulation. So whether you want to look at it from a deterministic viewpoint or the random viewpoint, you might end up with the same uh, conclusion. Okay. However, this is something that the deterministic viewpoint cannot afford. What is it? Suppose that I'm willing to accept the kernel. It could be Gaussians. It can be linear kernel in a product between the arguments. It can be, you know, hard functions, weights, what have you. So long as they, I mean, obey. There are some properties should be totally different. Uh, but I would love if someone could tell me what are the parameters of these Gaussian belts. The mean and the variance, for example. Because the variance can, for example, you know, afford more detail and abrupt changes to be tracked. Okay. Now suppose that I don't know the variance. I suppose the mean is mean zero. But let's suppose that I don't know the variance of my kernel. It's Gaussian belt, and I don't know the variance. Sigma kappa squared. Suppose I don't know the variance of my knowledge. It's sigma n squared. Uh -huh. Let's call them hyperparameters. OK? Because they enter the way they enter. But you can integrate the conditional likelihood by marginalizing out the f and get the honest of that likelihood. And guess what? you can carry out maximum likelihood estimation to come up with this alpha. Okay? What have you done here? You have treated f as a nuisance parameter. Do you remember from your basics in estimation theory? If I have parameters that are, or unknowns that I don't know, I don't want to focus on, I integrate them out if they are random. What are you going to do? with f is deterministic. You cannot integrate it out. Here, it is the probability density function of f that allows you, this is the prior, the Gaussian prior, allows you to do that. So let's compare it with, so with GP regression. Look at what you have done. The likelihood, of course, is Gaussian. It has kt. These are the unknowns of the, it includes the sigma kappa square. And this one, the couples includes the sigma n square. And then you can maximize it easily. In contrast, what, what I have uh, stressed here is that the selection of the kernel is decoupled from the estimation of the function. So n you can have. <coughs> now, this is pretty good. So I gave you in this slide a beautiful and attractive feature of Bayesian approach to function learning. That you can handle hyperparameters. Okay. Ah, there's a price paid, no? Not everything comes as a beautiful lunch that was provided for this. So, and there is this fish called cold, huh? the curse of the nationality. What is Bacala, right? So we see here that both the conditional expectation of the LMC or the mean is a linear function of y t, and very good, we have the variance expression quantification. But look at this inverse. And remember that when we start collecting t, this matrix is growing dimension. 
But sometimes you need to have millions of, millions of training sets for learning tasks. So what are you going to do with this OD cube complexity? And the storage, even if you are symmetric positive definite, it is quadratic storage of these matrices. Okay? So, and in this thing that I mentioned, again, uh, you have a careful dimension, the, the, the likelihood has a covariance that uh, is d by d, and you need to invert it. Ah, I forgot to say, if you want to go through the deterministic approach to find the higher parameters, the problem is definitely not complex. Because you are trying to minimize uh, the you are inside the KT and you multiply it with KT, right? So that's an uncommon problem. So this one is decoupled, so that's the beauty. Okay. There have been remedies over the last 15 years to this problem. And I list uh, a number of representative ones. Eh? Someone? Okay, good. Uh, they, you, assume, you can assume that this matrix is low rank, and then you don't need as much as the dimension, uh, but as much as the rank, that's another. Then you can have uh, sparse uh, constraints, sparse constraints. So that's tricky. Uh, instead, we have been very uh, much uh, uh, involved with another trick that was introduced in a general context by Rahimi and Brecht. But I, I find it uh, that is extremely important in functional approximation as well. So this is Mr. Fourier, okay? And uh, we will rely on uh, the Fourier transform of the kappa. Kappa, remember, uh, is the kernel function, right? the building block. And I have a kappa bar because I want it to be a normalized one, so I can normalize it. Uh, it should be integrated one. Okay. For instance, you will see. But it is the kernel. The kernel is covariance, if especially is time invariant and uh, uh, stationary. What's it was? What do I mean stationary kernel? The kernel is the function between between two input data, x and x prime, kappa of x comma x prime. If this is equal to kappa of x minus x prime, the difference is called stationary. Okay. So we have a station again. That's there's a class, there's a broader class, but let's stick to that one. It's easier for me to explain. But if I have a stationary process, which has a one variable covariance, uh, and I take the Fourier transform, what do I get? The power spectrum density. When? And what if I normalize the power spectrum density to integrate one? I get a PDF. Uh -huh. Okay. So this is what I'm doing here. F of kappa bar, Fourier transfer of kappa bar, and that's why I chose the word pi. Okay. I we don't have a. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Imagine this is the, the, Fourier, the Fourier variable. It's like the omega, right? Frequency, right? but it's a vector frequency. So now, once you have a PDF, suppose that we have the Gaussian bell. Gaussian, Fourier transform of Gaussian is Gaussian, right? Remember that from signals and systems. And uh, I can draw samples from a Gaussian PDF. We know that. how to do that, right? With a desired covariance also. And that's what you do. You draw samples. How many? Let's say B. It will turn out that there is a trade-off. But you like B. 
you draw D. You can afford to draw D, you do so. Okay, then instead of uh, so instead of going so basically after you project these samples onto any X and this is called the random feature vector. Why is random feature? Because it comes from the random vector V. It's here sine and cosine. Okay? And the, the most critical part of this guy is that if you take the inner product of this random vector, which has size 2D, because D is the V, and I have sine and cosine version, so 2D. So the, it turns out that if you take the inner product of phi transpose x, phi x, then you can approximate the kernel. Wow. Why it's important, we'll see it in a second. But all I told you is that instead of getting a generic kernel, which is a nonlinear transformation of x, x prime, right? Go through a nonlinear transformation of x first using sines and cosines and the v, and then take the inner product. And that will approximate it. If you want the intuition why this is correct, uh, think of the uh, characteristic function. It's an expected value of e to the something. Characteristic function and Fourier transfer or Fourier pairs. A PDF is Fourier pairs, right? So the expected value, which is e to the j something, has a sine and a cosine. If you take the inner product, you do a sample average over the vectors, over the d vectors. And if the sample average, if d is large enough, the low large numbers will get us to the to a, to a expected value. I, I just like to give you some intuition why this uh, kappa check is a reasonably a good approximation of the kappa. Now, what's the key idea? The key idea is that we have, uh, we can prove very easily that uh, if you start with a vector theta, which is drawn from a Gaussian distribution, and you take the inner product with this random features, you get an F check, it's an approximation of that, that is Gaussian. Why? Because theta is Gaussian. I told you X, think of it as Gaussian, after you draw the V. Then it's a linear covariance, it's Gaussian for sure. So the question is what's the covariance? Ah, okay, the covariance of this, if you take the expected value of theta, theta transpose, you will get the identity, and then phi will show up and QED. I prove to you that this model F check is a Gaussian process with this covariance, which it can be estimated. Okay? You say, what, what are we playing here? Little exercises. Uh -huh. You want to observe something here that the approximant is uh, parametric. Okay. From your uh, basics or estimation theory or spectrum estimation, whatever you remember, what's the difference between parametric and parametric? Someone tells you, I ask these questions. What is the difference between parametric estimation approach and non-parametric estimation approach? And do we have volunteers, not the professors that teach? Volunteers. Yes, sir. Yeah, Bonucci. Francesco Binucci. Binucci. <laughs> Bonucci is a, a top player, right? Left, left defender. B exactly. Yes, sir. In a parametric estimation approach, uh, I am supposed to have uh, a known form for my function, which depends on some parameters. Uh -huh. And I try to learn uh, the optimal values of uh, yeah. these parameters. Yeah. While in a non 
while uh, in, a, <laughs> in a non-parametric approach uh, I uh, want to learn uh, all the structure of the function. Yeah, but let's be fair. In the parametric, you, you have to commit that uh, the model you select, let's not uh, take everything. But I wanted to ask you whether, if we take out the accuracy of the model, can you tell me, from a computational perspective, which one would you love to, to deal with, to play with? With the parametric model. Why? Because uh, uh, in a parametric model, if I have a finite set, uh, finite, finite set. <laughs> I'm Italian, I'm sorry. <laughs> finite, finite. Uh, yes, finite set to learn uh, maybe uh, if uh, it has a fixed uh, and low cardinality. Let me let me make it easier. You're correct. You you got the point. The, the easy way of saying it is that as I collect more data, as t increases, the number of unknowns in the parametric stay the same. It's in the non-parametric, they grow. And this was the problem, the chaos of dimensionality we were talking about. Okay, very good. So let's see what's happening here with this check. So that's why we love this approximation. It takes a non-parametric problem fundamentally, which is function estimation, GP-based. It takes a non-parametric model and maps it to parametric. It's an approximation. Right? That's beautiful approximation. And this one shows that if you look at the prior of F check, not the original prior, it's basically zero mean, and it has a, it has a 2D rank approximation of the phi phi transpose, and this phi matrix has size uh, 2D by, uh, by T, okay? So the rank is 2D. So it's definitely we're gonna gain, okay? So RF treatment parametric GPs. So vanilla GP, we already, I'm doing a review here. RF pay GP, basically, you have a nonlinear map, right? And then you have a linear parameter. The parameter now theta is Gaussian. Then in the first one, you are looking for the posterior of y given f. <coughs> now you are looking at the posterior of y given theta and x. Okay. So here is the batch GPR uh, predictor. And for those of you that don't remember, the recursive squares, and the, the, the basic trick over here is that you can use the matrix inversion lemma, and if one of your dimensions is shorter than the other, like 2D, for example, is shorter than T, then you can take advantage, and instead of having a T by T, you can have to infer, you have a, uh, a D by T. So the complexity now is linear in T, not cubic, and it's cubic in D. And D is up to you. You can afford 100, 100. You can afford 10, 10. Of course, the approximation may not be as good. Because remember, the story here is that F check depends on how good is your approximation for the curve. But at least you are scalable. OK. But uh, a scalable. When P grows then more than to be, yes, sir. Is there any way to quantify how close you are with approximation of D? So suppose, like suppose you're sorry. So suppose you're estimating a certain function or a group of functions, and we try it with a certain D. Then, of course, we do not know how close you are, but suppose we do know the function that we are trying to estimate. I think you work out something yes. like how close are you? I, don't, I have not done it now, but intuitively, yes. Why? Because you have to resort to asymptotics. Both of them are large enough. But you can make claims that D would be order of this relative to D. That you can make sustain, say. Because it's 
it boils down to the low large numbers. Yeah. There is another trick that I'm going to do. I'm sure that if I continue this this way, that we're going to have a third meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's better we we have fun than even cover me. Uh, what I was saying. Anyways, I forgot. I'll remember. Yeah. So. The next thing that I want to stress is that uh, you can expect these things already by their forms and their similarity to recursively squares and LMSC. This should be an online version of the frame. And sure enough, actually, not only an online, but we're going to call it uh, in incremental because it's like learning the function incrementally. Okay? Does it have to be time, in other words? And uh, the nature can give some y that does not obey the, so you have to take a decision before and then correct it. OK, so the blue ovals are uh, uh, posteriors, and the others are predictive PDFs. Right? So basically, now that we are with RF-based learning, random feature-based, so uh, when someone gives me an xt plus 1, I can take if I know everything up to time t, and I'm getting x t plus 1, I can predict the y t plus 1 given y t. Okay? This is like the uh, predictive PDF. And then, uh, if you give me the y t plus 1, then I can, oh, I should have said how I compute this predictive PDF. The predictive PDF, you can imagine, like, is y t plus 1, comma theta. And then you use base rule, integrate over theta, you get only the y t plus 1, right? Is that clear? On this predictive. So you can find the predictive. So you form a prediction of what is coming up. And then the y comes and you correct. You adjust yourself. So uh, and then if you're, uh, if you're talking about Gaussian pro process regression, then you can do everything in closed form. So you start from the posterior up to t. You have an estimate of theta hat t and its covariant sigma sub t. And then you get a normal uh, predictive PDF. Now uh, your prediction, the predictor is linear, and it has a quantifiable uh, covariance. And then when you are given the yt plus 1, you have an update that should be familiar to recursive this Okay? And you can update the covariance recursively as well. Is that clear? Okay. Complexity, linear in D, quadratic in D. That's what you buy out with uh, the fact that if you have Recasting the squares in a stationary process, you go from EQ to D. Right? You, you can play. Okay. Let's talk about an application since the, the word IoT is in the title. So, yes, sir. Just a question. Yes. What is the difference in the accuracy if you have had the all likely in advance and make a. Uh, is there any loss in accuracy because you're doing this iterative? No, there is not. If you start, it's pretty much like. Recursive the squares. If you start with a bunch and you're accurate, yeah. then you can go one by one. Otherwise, you are uh, approximating the bunch in the steady state. Yes, yeah. But it depends on your initialization, actually. Otherwise, okay. Air quality monitoring using IoT uh, sensors. So here is normalized this square error, iteration. So we have an online uh, air quality monitoring uh, WSM, wireless sensor network. And XT are the hourly concentration of 13 chemicals of average sensor response. Then these are some of the things that uh, we don't like, uh, nitrogen dioxide. And then YT is the concentration of the polluting, uh, polluting chemicals. So that's the output. Uh, so you get 
to observe what out there in the air, right? And then you have uh, you measure all the other thirteen. You don't know how they are involved, right? So you don't know the f how f of x yields the y. That's what you're trying to find. Is that clear? So you have x t's, you have the y t, and you're trying to find that mapping. Okay, so uh, normalizing the square error versus iteration, uh, the, uh, the Gaussian processes look like this. Actually, this one, I happen to have an extension that I will cover afterwards. So in a way, this should have gone later. This Gaussian process, let's say, TP online is low, and this is blue, which is the lower, the lower the better, right? Now, uh, what is amazing is that if you compare also normalized CPU time and you compare with alternatives that have different abbreviations uh, from these people here, then uh, the blue is 10 to the minus 2, and uh, the rest are, can be two orders of magnitude uh, more complex. So, scalability is indeed an attractive feature. Uh, lower NMSC is there are other uh, things uh, that you can do. I'm trying to. Yes, sir. Can you go back to the oh. Yeah. Tell me. Why is it uh, getting worse? With, uh, eh? Why is it getting worse? With the blue curve is going down. With iteration, the blue curve. Ah, the, there are a number of uh, a number of reasons in this part. Oh, it doesn't go consistently up. I don't know actually why. Uh, but I should have shown a little bit. So the, this is actually not the GP version. It's the uh, ensemble. So I don't know whether we had a good combination of Hermes to make it. Good point. Uh, there are other uh, things. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, classification of remote sensing. So you, you're getting multispectral images. And, uh, that, and you want to figure out whether pixels uh, belong to clouds or not. So basically, the large-scale imagery involves Gaussian processes. There are 256 squares as the axis. And then uh, here, I'm showing classifiers uh, using infrared signals and Gaussian processes. And the blue is clear sky in the dark uh, brownish is basically a uh, cloud. And this one uh, basically reveals that as time passes, the classification rate stays close to 90% as different frames are being processed. So that is to say the, the map from the multispectral XT vector to uh, the 0, 1 which is labeled uh, cloud no cloud uh, fairly, it can be well estimated using Gaussian processes. Let me also touch another application. Uh, uh, so this is dynamic uh, estimation. We don't know x, the state x. We only know y. And uh, given observations, Y, you want to estimate X, which is offline, and uh, use, you can use GP models for F and G. So this is basically uh, an exciting robotics application. So Gaussian process models can extrapolate and interpolate missing data. Whenever I tell you what's the function, it's not only extrapolation, but it's also interpolation that you can do. And, uh, then I'll talk about dynamics later on. But here, for example, what you want to notice is that these are Gaussian curves and linear curves. OK. So uh, the blue dots are state estimates, and the green dots are state prediction. And uh, uh, basically, the, the, the different uh, states are uh, measurements that are recorded in the different parts of the body of an individual of a robot. And uh, you can uh, figure out the trajectory that it follows and 
make adjustments accordingly. Well, uh, we, have a bit more. Yeah. we advocated Gaussian processes as a, a Bayesian approaches to function estimation, then we saw that there is a possibility that uh, there is a possibility to, through random features, to have parametric approximates of those, still st stay within the Bayesian to parametric approximates with a number of attractive features, right? Scalability, effectivity, online, and so on. But uh, the last 10 years almost now, everybody talks about deep neural networks, which are primarily uh, parametric function estimation, like estimators, right? So, yes, we have those. And uh, just to establish some notation and make some claims on their relationship. OK, so the first layer, layer number one, has a linear combination. Dx is the dimensionality of x. Linear combination of x inputs uh, with a w and n. And then it can have some biases, b, u, n. Superscript always will be uh, used to denote the layer. So here we have in the first layer, okay? So you have a linear combination, an affine combination of the input x, okay? And then subsequent layers, and ah, the, I forgot to say that the subscript u uh, signifies the number of neurons per layer, okay? So the subscript is neuron index, the superscript is layer. And you can uh, notice that if you are at layer L minus 1, and you have the F, the function of x, then the, you pass it through a memoryless nonlinearity. If it was, if you want to go uh, from 1 to 2, uh, then you, you form a G nu 1, which is the output of the first. G is the output, F is the input. And this nonlinearity is the memoryless red rule we're having. And uh, if you want to uh, proceed now with the next input to the next layer, you combine the output of all the Gs with linear with an affine transformation. I hope that notation is clear. Is it? However, since we want to compare apples with apples, uh, you may be familiar with the fact that there are people we have talked about Bayesian neural networks, BNNs. And then they view these parameters Ws and the biases B with corresponding variances C check with W C check B per layer L as zero mean Gaussian. Okay? And then for bounded variance per layer, we have bounded variance per layer, they introduce normalized versions of the variances per neuron. So you basically divide the C check W by NL minus 1, the previous layer number. And likewise for the biases. And in doing so, uh, you are assured that you don't have unbounded variance because it would grow as you proceed from layer to layer if you don't normalize at any time. Okay? OK, so here is the, uh, what makes a Gaussian BNN, the linear com combining coefficients and the biases are uh, Gaussian distributed with a corresponding uh, covariances. Here is where everything started in this direction, back in 1996. So Mr. Neil. Uh, proved that if you have two layers, and if these outputs of it of the first layer has bounded variance, then 
as you make the number of neurons of the first layer to grow, this output from the second layer, I'm sorry, the output uh, will, after the nonlinearity, I guess, no, this one should be, the output should be G, right? Uh -huh. No? I see. Okay. Yeah. If we, let me just go to the previous to remember. Ah, okay. So G2 is after, it's the output, right? The G2 is always the output, but we have to do the G1. Okay. All right. So uh, the G1 has bound variance, and the, this is, should be the input to the next one after passing it through a nonlinearity, then it converges in distribution to a zero mean GB with this covariance matrix. And correlated from neuron to neuron, so there's no correlation. And per neuron, you have an expected value or a covariance, if you like, or a kernel, if you like. You can think now where I'm going. That depends on the memoryless linearity and the affine transformation of it. Okay? Think a little bit. What you are doing is basically a linear combination of things. If you start with any PDF and you do many linear combinations, you have to go to the ocean. That doesn't take rocket science. You need to have boundary variance. So, the law of large numbers. And, uh, but that's, that's great, right? That adds credibility to a GP. But the only thing the GP guy says is that, okay, if you believe that indeed you can have wide Bayesian neural networks, wide meaning not deep, wide, many neurons, then you, it's like, you have to accept the GP assumption without any fear. Okay, okay the sketch of the proof I said, L equals 2, Gaussian DNN, I said all this. Central limit theorem, uh, SN1 goes to infinity, Gaussian DF with mean and variance. Okay? For L equals 2, the 1 is a linear combination. So we have uh, W being Gaussian, the X linear combination, this F1 is Gaussian. Okay? Then we take F1, which is Gaussian, remember there's a linearity. This is non Gaussian. But again, because I sum it and average it, again, I can send it to, uh, if I, I send N1 to infinity, then again I'm going to get a Gaussian. Okay? Click. Likewise, if you have T training vectors, you can make analogous uh, assumptions. So uh, the kernels can be computed recursively, that's another thing. But uh, so, the question is, you have finite NL. So how many finite number of neurons that lay it out, okay? Then you define a width function, and what, you, what people have proved in 2018 is that if you have a Bayesian neural network uh, with a low activation function and any X tau, there are strictly increasing um, functions HLT so basically, HLT is a number of neurons uh, that you need to increase as you increase uh, T, okay? So that, that's all that they suggest. So then as T goes to infinity, you can argue that the neural network output converges to a GP with kernel that has this epsilon is basically the W uh, H plus, the X plus B after the linearity, okay? So here's an empirical comparison. I, I don't want to go through because I'm already to. What, what I want to make here is that there are people which have devised metrics. This one is called maximum mean discrepancy metric. And basically, what you want to do is you want to compare the Y, the PDF of Y that comes out of the Bayesian neural network and that, uh, that comes out of the Gaussian process. And if these two are close, because they call mean discrepancy, there's an expected value here, 
GY, expected value, Y. One is GP, the other is BNN. And then the supremum is the maximum discrepancy. So it turns out that this maximum discrepancy, because it has expected values, it can be computed by some leverages. Okay? And over here, if you don't see the y-axis, I am plotting the MMD, maximum mean discrepancy metric, versus number of hidden layers. And what you see here are three cases. The blue has one hidden layer, the orange has two hidden layers, and the greenish has three. The orange is two. Okay. Now, uh, what happens is the if what, what you notice here is if you have a shallow Bayesian neural network, that's the bluish, you have a very fast convergence as the number of hidden units or neurons increases per layer. Okay? So uh, you can think of GPs pushing you to go wide or where is uh, descriptive form of neural networks push you to, if you want to synthesize more complicated nonlinearities, you, you are recommended to go deep. So you can think of Gaussian processes getting you wide, the other getting you deep. Okay. But let's talk a little bit when we want to go deep. Uh, People have considered back in, you know, almost 10 years ago that uh, you may have deep Gaussian processes. So you have uh, L layer GPs, and what is the, the motivating reason is that doing that, going deep, you have ability to express more complicated nonlinear functions. Okay? That's basically the key advantage. Everything else is, is really uh, challenging. But all I can tell you is that what we have done is that, uh, uh, what is the, a, a nice advantage? Let me start from that point. So the f function, remember the notation before? The f function is Gaussian processes with certain kappa i l. I remind you, I is the neuron, L is the layer, okay? And then you basically, tau is the, uh, HL tau is the function from layer L minus one to layer L. Uh, then what happens is the following. Once you have the HL tau for, the tau is running for T, it's the temporal. Uh, then you have, if you are in layer L, then you have H memoryless on linearities. Then if you can stack all the T, all the tau from one up to T, you get a matrix H of T, and your initialization is the XT, which is the input. Now, here is your prior. It's a DGP prior, which you can clearly recognize that is non-Gaussian. Because you uh, can, um, express it successively applying Bayes rule as this product, uh, layer after layer after layer. This is after capital L layers. And the likelihood, again, can be assumed to be tradable, but it is intractable because you look at what you have to integrate here. You have to integrate over matrices which are of size uh, T by, by L, the number of layers, and you have a lot of those. So uh, not uh, doable, but you can bring uh, random features to the rescue. And then again, instead of a nonlinear HL function, you have theta L that is Gaussian, but uh, and every vector, every column has dimension two times the L. Okay, so the data likelihood is this. And if you want to get a flavor of how you can handle Gaussian processes, deep Gaussian processes with random features, there is a training phase where you want to find the uh, hardware parameters alpha, and you want to have, find the posterior of theta given y. Remember, in the case of, uh, of uh, uh, 
The number of features we we go after parameter PDS. So, and the idea, because this is intractable, is to approximate it with a tractable. And in, uh, this is called variation difference in statistics. And the idea is that uh, although things are not independent, you approximate them with a tractable to your theta that has all the variables uh, separable. So separable with respect to layers, you must have a product over layers. You have a product over neurons per layer, and you have a product from dimension uh, d. That, because remember, we have a, a feature. We have a random feature here. But if you do all this, then you can, uh, because this one is Gaussian, you can formulate, uh, this is likelihood, and this is prior, and use stochastic optimization to uh, estimate all the parameters that you so desire. And when you have testing, you draw realizations of theta from the surrogate, which is tractable, and then you replace this the y star given y. This is what you are after. Right? You are going to find the output y star in the testing case, in the testing phase. And then you have to integrate over t theta. But look at how much simpler it becomes when you have univariate PDFs and you draw runs or draws from a Gaussian PDF, and you sum it up. So basically, this is what facilitates the. Now, let me show you uh, how uh, you can test for using deep uh, Gaussian processes for regression. This is a power plant. The edge here is the ambient uh, measurements, like the pressure, the humidity, the temperature, blah, blah, blah. And then the output is the electric uh, energy output. <coughs> so the number of samples is about 10,000, and the dimension here, the x, is 4. So uh, what I show here is the root mean square error versus runtime. And here, obviously, the lower the better. The red one, which is the lower, is uh, deep Gaussian processes. The adopted kernel is radial basis function. And uh, what is shown here is the negative of likelihood. And because maximum likelihood, you want to see maximum, the negative of likelihood you want to see basically uh, as small as possible. So the DGP is the lowest. And uh, in terms of RMSC, and mean negative of likelihood of what I just said, again, it is uh, the lowest. Interestingly, uh, the deep neural networks, which is the green, is performing worse. So all I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of interest over the years, but uh, it doesn't have to look at alternatives or combine things with things like Gaussian processes that would improve performance of additional networks. This is a protein, uh, real data from a protein network. Now the time slots are 45,000, nine dimensions. So there are protein structure attributes. How many? Nine of them. And uh, so that's nine by one vector. And there is a uh, protein fu functionality. And again, the red, which is the DGP RBF, uh, does better in root mean square error, as well as in uh, uh, mean negative log likelihood. Only the blue, the blue is the <coughs> the uh, deep Gaussian processing with uh, uh, ensemble. Uh, that I have not talked about yet. So the DGP is lower and quantified than certainty. That's another thing I wanted to stress. Now, over here, you don't see the green. Okay? You don't see how a neural network is performing. So here, you see that this error doesn't do well. <coughs> but what is the negative of that? Because it is a deterministic approach, whereas the you know, Bayesian approach can offer you also the uh, 
and similar questions uh, come up from uh, real data for classification. This is EEG data, approximately 15,000 time samples, and now we have 14 uh, electrodes, uh, 14 uh, electrodes, and we collect measurements. And this is perhaps how uh, your, your state trooper will give you figures in the future. So this is why you want to decide whether you have consumed enough alcohol or not. Right? One. Right? You? <laughs> I'm not drinking. <laughs> so uh, the RF based GPs scale very well. Not only they exhibit a uh, very low error, but also the runtime is uh, very attractive. Uh, you see the accuracy, but also the runtime. Uh, no, the runtime is. Now this here is the uh, accuracy classification accuracy for different uh, data sets. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say about the big Gaussian process. So I talked about Gaussian processes. I talked about their attractive features, right? Uh, you can estimate high parameters. You can do online. You can. Uh, and shoot scalability through approximations or run features. So you can take a non parametric approach and wed it with a parametric approach. And then I ask myself, why don't I compare the, the more sophisticated parametric approach, which is the deep neural networks, and I found that uh, Gaussian process has the ability to interpret uh, uh, DNNs and uh, they have potential for good. Uh, so in the next, for, yeah, in the next uh, segment, uh, I will talk about, depends on what you want to see, but here I didn't talk about incentives. I would like to talk a little bit about incentives. I will sum, and then I will move to uh, another problem, which seemingly uh, appears less relevant to, on the contrary, is more general than learning. Okay. There are a number of applications where uh, you know what is a good criteria. You know what's a good objective function. But you cannot write it down analytically. Okay? You know some things, but you don't know a lot. So these are called, that they go out under three names. Either they're called the black box optimization, or bandit optimization, or global optimization. Because not only you want to optimize with respect to something X that you would like, to, but on the way, you want to learn how the function looks like. That's the word black box optimization. And this is where Gaussian processes and non parametric approaches become really, really powerful in uh, black box optimization. And they don't have to be learning function. Can be anything. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, we need to take a break. <laughs> 